So. So uh, welcome everyone, and I just want to uh, kick off these by first of all saying, introducing myself. Uh, I'm Nancy Chen, and I'm a professor of anthropology here. I'm also the uh, director of the Blum Center, uh, which is focused on poverty alleviation, um, uh, social enterprise, and participatory governance. Thanks to David Shaw, who's actually the lead person who actually has been uh, running all this event. Uh, the, he is actually uh, the main reason why UCSC is the only campus in North America that is a member of the Right Likelihood College. Uh, the Right Likelihood Award uh, is uh, a very prestigious award given to uh, social um, activists and uh, uh, individuals who have been uh, focused on social justice uh, through their uh, career and work. And we're deeply, deeply fortunate to have uh, one of the Right Likelihood uh, laureates, uh, Stephen Curry, who's the founder of Sur uh, Survivor International. Um, before uh, we go into an introduction of Mr. Curry and his, uh, and his work, uh, we actually have two members of uh, his organization's uh, uh, Survival International, who are uh, here from San Francisco, uh, Dasha and Ilana, who are going to uh, actually come up and say a few words about the um, about the program and, and uh, all the uh, different activities uh, that uh, Survival International has done over the years. So thank you and welcome, and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Hi. So I'm Ilana, and this is Tesha, um, and we are the U.S. team. So we are small and we're always looking for you know help volunteers interns and what our work is is all about changing public opinion so we do outreach we do awareness education events like this um, hopefully one of many mm -hmm. um, and press communications I mean kind of the possibilities are endless we have been around since 1969 in the UK and in, throughout Europe it's um, so our US office is a little bit small but we are actually the oldest organization campaigning for these tribal people's rights, and we're the only ones who do it around the world. So thank you all for being here, and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. My name is Tesha, and in 2008, I had the rare opportunity to meet the Batwa tribe in Burundi. The Batwa are a pygmy people who are known as the first people of the first inhabitants of the land, and they were once revered for their knowledge and caretaking of the forest. However, the tribe I met wasn't in the forest. We drove up this really dusty road and the structures there were, their homes were these makeshift structures with UNHCR tarps over them. Their children were drinking out of these mosquito infested puddles in the ground and and it was absolutely devastating. The conditions I saw them living in, and um, they had no access to the forest, so that means no access to hunting, no access to gathering, no access to any of the traditions that um, they use to find meaning in life, and they have used for centuries. Um, so they were left to walk miles and miles every day and beg in the capital city where they're highly discriminated against, maybe try to hawk pottery. And I was, I was horrified. I didn't know, I didn't understand how people could be living this way and, and how no one seemed to care. And so I asked why, why weren't they living in their forest anymore? What happened? And I was told that environmental organizations, Western environmental organizations pressured the government to evict them to save the primates, which is very confusing considering they have coexisted quite well with primates for centuries and have never been known to eat gorillas or any of the things they were being claimed to do. And uh, I think the biggest emotion I felt was one of betrayal, I guess. I think here in the United States we see these big name NGOs and I thought of them as the change makers, the ones that were really going to heal the world or take care of the world. and and yet here I saw them as responsible for what I saw as incredible human rights abuses. And um, it was the questions that arose from this incident for me 
that actually led me to pursue a degree at UC Berkeley and do a thesis on the forced relocations of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. And unfortunately, I, I couldn't find answers. No one seemed to be talking about this. No one seemed to talk about when conservation goes wrong until I came across a few articles by Survival International. And it was the first time where I felt like, oh, I might not be crazy for feeling like human life should be valued, that, that conservation efforts should have oversight. And um, so after college, I applied for a job and got it, which was really awesome. And so I've been working for Survival for about a year now. And um, it's an honor to be able to campaign on these issues that I'm so passionate about. And it's an honor to work with an organization that isn't afraid to take on the biggest actors, if it's governments or corporations or even sometimes NGOs. And uh, it's an even bigger honor right now to be able to invite up Director of Survival, Stephen Corey, to talk more about these issues with you. So thank you all for coming and please give a warm well welcome to Stephen Corey. <laughs> Is that working? Yeah, good. Thank you, Tesha. Thank you, David and Nancy, for organizing this. Uh, it's always, for me, a bit intimidating to talk to uh, academics. I'm not an academic. I'm not even a scholar. Um, and uh, part of the problem, of course, is that often academics think they know more than me. And uh, often, I think they're right. <laughs> so. So bear with me, and when we come to questions, please no jargon or technical <laughs> word. I haven't read the books, I won't understand uh, what you're talking about. My own personal story is not dissimilar to Tesh's, except it happened 45 years ago. It was not really to do with conservation, it was more to do with uh, the, the god of, of economic progress, uh, which I also realized was something of a betrayal. But I'm not going to talk about that. In fact, I've never mentioned it in public before, and I'm not going to go into it now. <laughs> so, survival is, styles itself the global movement for tribal people's rights. We use the term tribal instead of indigenous very consciously, but I won't go into that now. We might go into that later. And what we say we do is we help them to defend their lives, to protect their lands, and to determine their own futures. And the overarching question, which should always, I hope, dictate our strategies and what we do and the answers to the questions and what we do next is, how can we do those things, defend their lives, help them defend their lives, protect their lands, uh, determine their own futures, how can we do that most efficiently with very limited resources. So where do our resources come from? Well, they come from basically the public. Public supporters, often quite small amounts of money, ordinary people um, all over the world. We don't get national government money. We have a policy of uh, not taking it. We don't get big corporate foundation uh, grants. Um, we get some small foundation grants, but the, 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 the corporate foundation sector is, um, has its own agenda, of course, and will eventually determine and rewrite the agendas of the people it funds. So we're very keen on our financial independence. Uh, we, that means we need money, of course, so if anybody has any spare money, well, you know, <laughs> don't hesitate to think of us uh, uh, in your um, giving it away. So, what I would like to do now is run through quickly a kind of approach. Our approach, as I say, determined by how do we most efficiently use these scarce resources to achieve those aims. It's changed over the decades, and how I would characterize it now is really in kind of two tracks. On the one track, we have individual cases. So we'll work on specific cases of specific violations of rights uh, for a specific people. And we uh, will be working at any one time on maybe a dozen of these pretty intensively, and maybe another 
uh, several dozen with some less intensity. Uh, and it, they basically boil down to land rights, trying to stop people's land being stolen from them. And then we work on a second, if you like, a parallel track, which is to try and influence public opinion, to shift public opinion more in favour of tribal peoples and their rights. The, the cases is in a way the, the easiest way to describe and the easiest way to do that actually is to show you a little film I've got four little films this one is uh, three and a half minutes and it describes the case of a group of Indians in the northeast of Brazil the Awa that we've been working on for a long time maybe 15 years more actually but intensively from about three or four, three years ago, um, and the, the film in those three minutes tries to, you know, telescope kind of what uh, we were able to achieve. Asha Ota Akushi U Amome Jehoa Ayu Panahan, dear Kosh Awa Mapanahan Ka. Since time immemorial, this forest has been home to the Awa. It provides everything they need. But over the last three decades, over 30% of their central territory has been destroyed by illegal logging. The Awa have witnessed not only the death of their forest, but also their friends and family. In 2012, Survival launched a campaign to save the Awa. The solution was simple. Protect their land and the tribe can thrive. Brazil's Minister of Justice had the power to stop the invasions. We needed to give him a message he could not ignore. We asked you to listen and we asked you to take action. This was a chance to really make a difference and this is your story. The techniques we're using, you can see it's fairly obvious, getting people to write letters to government, to ministers, getting material into the media in the widest possible sense, uh, the established media, um, the internet media and so on and so forth, uh, lobbying, applying all the normal 
techniques of applying pressure that uh, have been tried and tested uh, for the last uh, 200 years at least. Uh, that's a kind of fairly typical case. Um, the fact that it, uh, it, it worked so quickly, we, were under, we thought it would take longer than two years actually. The fact it worked so quickly was of course very encouraging. Our first sort of really tangible major success, a bit similar, was with the Yanomami land rights in the north of Brazil, a much bigger area, 10,000 Yanomami Indians in the north of Brazil. That was a campaign which really took 20 years uh, before the government uh, demarcated their lands. Uh, so things are speeding up. Before we just leave the uh, cases, as I say, they're relatively easy to understand, but I thought I'd show you one more uh, little film. This one's only two and a half minutes, and it concerns a Indian people um, on the other side of Brazil called the Kawahiva. the southern fringes of the Brazilian Amazon. Once a vast blanket of dense rainforest, now one of the most violent regions in Brazil. Armed loggers and powerful ranchers are illegally raising the trees to the ground. Here live the uncontacted Kawahiva Indians. They hunt, fish and gather fruits and honey, living on the run to escape violence from outsiders. Attacks and disease have killed their relatives. These are the last of the Kawahiva, one of the most vulnerable peoples on the planet. If their land is not protected, they will disappear forever. But if Brazil's government acts fast, they can survive. We are the global movement for tribal people's rights and we're doing everything we can to secure the Kawahiva's land for them. Help us make Brazil take action. Join the movement. Uh, we, we've devised a kind of rubric which we call the Brutal Savage and in this there's some articles which I've done uh, to describe uh, attacking people like uh, Napoleon Chagnon, the famous anthropologist who thinks that uh, the Yanomami live in a perpetual state of warfare. He's about the only anthropologist who worked with the Yanomami who does think that many others have thought uh, that's uh, rubbish and it's actually quite easy to demolish his uh, so-called data and the numbers uh, that he is using um, which are just plain wrong and they're, contra they're clearly manipulated. Uh, Steven Pinker who's also one of the proponents of the idea that everybody lived in a state of moral turpitude until uh, more or less when he was born 60 years ago and then suddenly we're all uh, climbing the sun of the uplands of great morality. Jared Diamond, who also thinks that everybody was living in a state of great uh, violence uh, uh, until um, recently, more or less the same time that he came on the scene too. So uh, uh, how, how do we counter these things? Well, we try and obviously write articles about it. We will take, uh, make formal complaints to broadcasting authorities when there's clearly racist stuff appearing on television, uh, often those complaints are upheld. We had a recent case, an Australian documentary about some, uh, an Indian group in Brazil, which focused on their uh, infanticide 
uh, clearly racist terms. It could have been 1890, and we launched a, a formal complaint about that, which was uh, upheld. We've influenced broadcasters' uh, policy guidelines for their own editors, sometimes so successfully that actually I'm not allowed to tell you which broadcasters those are, but some, some prominent uh, international broadcasters have written guidelines for their own uh, editors according to the way we view things rather than um, this kind of racist uh, 19th century colonialist uh, yeah. rubbish. Uh, we think it's as important to shift public opinion as it is to work on cases. Whatever happens in a specific case, you know, get the loggers out of a bit of our wild territory. Great. Uh, uh, in two years, they can come back. The only thing next month, they can come back. The only thing that's really stopping them coming back is the Brazilian the, the perception of the Brazilian government that there would be an international outcry if that was allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. And that depends on uh, trying to create a groundswell of public opinion, to shift public opinion in favour of, uh, of tribal peoples. We've had some unexpected successes when we started working in Botswana, uh, trying to prevent the eviction of Bushman peoples from uh, a so-called game reserve in the centre of Botswana. Uh, we were told specifically that uh, we would have absolutely no chance of uh, moving Botswanan public opinion in favour of uh, Bushmen. Uh, and in fact, after so many years of, <coughs> again, placing stuff with the Botswana press, part of it was actually rather sympathetic to us, or became rather sympathetic to us and to the Bushmen, uh, there was a, 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 a sea change in Botswanan public opinion. The point where, when I was last in Botswana, I'm not allowed into Botswana nowadays, when I was last in Botswana, I stopped to fill up uh, my car at a gas station and the gas petrol pump attendant, gas pump attendant, whatever you call that, uh, recognised me. My picture had been in the newspapers. I was public enemy number one. Uh, not, not a comfortable uh, thing to see yourself on the front page. Um, and said, uh, you know, hello, Mr. Corey, how are you? I said, well, what do you think of what's going on in this central Kalahari game reserve? And she said, if the people want to live there, why not? Why should they not be allowed to continue to live there? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, uh, we weren't expecting that. And uh, it, it's clearly changed, as I say, public perception of these issues in Botswana. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's an uphill battle. It's a battle which has been fought many times. Uh, the anti-slavery movement, 200 years ago in Britain, uh, the, uh, the abolition of slavery took 70 years. Uh, I don't know about so much about the American history, but in Britain it was 70 years between the first pamphleting of the anti-slavery abolitionists to the point where slavery was made illegal throughout the British Empire. And they had a similar hill to climb. Slavery at the beginning of that period was widely perceived as being, being a good thing. No major world religion had anything bad to say about it. It was perceived to be a good thing, not only for us, uh, because they did all the work, but also, and, and of course, European civilization is built on slavery. Athens, Rome, etc., etc., uh, is entirely, these cities are built on slavery. Uh, but it was also perceived to be a good thing for the slaves themselves. It took them out of their benighted, uh, uh, you know, pagan existence, gave them the benefits of Christianity mm. and hard work. <laughs> so to move public opinion from thinking that to thinking, no, slavery is uh, morally reprehensible, it should not be allowed, took a long time, it was successful, and uh, really every human rights movement, if you think about it, has to go through the same process, the women's movement, so on and so forth. So these are not uh, insurmountable battles. So that's the, that's the two-track approach, moving public opinion, working on cases. So now I shift gear, and I would like to talk about two things. One is, uh, and, and they are the, what I call the kind of secular ideologies, which are now dominant uh, in the states, in the Western world, widely. Uh, and they are, on the one hand, economic progress, which is going to lead us all into sunlit uplands of uh, uh, wonderful life, uh, and on the other, environmentalism. And uh, I, I would hope, 
well, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing that maybe with this audience I have to do less to convince you there's something wrong with the notion of infinite economic progress um, uh, and, and spend more, a little bit more time talking about environmentalism and, and what's gone wrong with that. I call them secular ideologies. In fact, if you look at them and you look at the language used, they are also theological. We're talking about belief systems here. We're not really talking about anything remotely scientific. They're, these are beliefs. Uh, and indeed, if you compare... Uh, I don't know, I'm not the first person to say this. If you compare the beliefs of these uh, uh, secular theologies with the kind of dominant beliefs that came into the States with Calvinism, um, Protestantism, with the early settlers, you find a lot of similarities uh, um, moving towards a kind of... Uh, uh, moving from a Garden of Eden, man's fall, a sinful man, a less sinful man changes his ways, then there's going to be a lot of problems, plague, flood, pestilence, and so on and so forth. So, but, but, but leave that aside for a moment. To deal with the economic part of it, economic progress, um, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to show another little short film. This one's less than two and a half minutes, but I think it's quite... Uh, it's our film. It illustrates uh, our view on what's wrong with economic progress. As we set out through the dense jungle, we had but one goal in mind. To bring the people sustainable development. However, in this case, we did encounter an unexpected challenge. We discovered that these people, in their own peculiar kind of way, were already sustainable. So all we could really bring them was development. We started by taking them through the process of participatory community project building, but they refused to fully participate. Next, we tried income-generating activities. But for some strange reason, they seemed satisfied with less than a dollar a day. We even tried empowering them, but their reaction was much more powerful than we expected. But we weren't going to give up on these people so easily. We knew they needed our help, even if they weren't aware of it. So we opted for the multi-stakeholder cross-disciplinary approach. We developed innovative private sector partnerships. Then we taught the people vocational skills that were adapted to a shifting economy. We created tough conservation measures to protect the environment from further harm. And we developed ambitious social safety nets to protect those unable to care for themselves. I'd say it's been a challenging process. We've learned many important lessons and we really look forward to applying them elsewhere in the future. But for now, let us just say, welcome to the Global Village. Good, so let's park uh, environmental progress for the moment. Um, uh, economic progress. Well, so what about environmentalism? Well, there's a, there's a little, two for two seconds in the middle of that cartoon, you get uh, a, a little bit of an environmental message, what, what really happens uh, in a lot of the world still. We've called this, this is a relatively recent um, campaign of ours, and we've called it Stop the Con, uh, Con Confidence Trick, uh, Stop the Confidence Trick. Uh, and so what do we mean by the confidence trick? Well, I suppose uh, several things. Firstly, that uh, <coughs> environmentalism is, at least in the minds of uh, the public, uh, basically hijacked by the mega conservation 
industrial scale corporations, uh, WWF, Conservation International, and so on and so forth. The, these are massive organizations, WWF getting $2 million a day in donations every day. Uh, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society is another one. That's the new, that's the recent name for what used to be the Bronx Zoo. Bronx Zoo, which uh, uh, kept uh, the uh, pygmy otter benga in, in a cage uh, uh, over a hundred years ago. So these, these institutions have hijacked environmentalism. They have created this idea, started in the States, 150 years ago actually uh, of wilderness so the idea of wilderness is here is a landscape untouched by uh, sinful human beings um, it, it isn't true uh, the, the landscapes that they were talking about Yellowstone, Yosemite and so on and so forth these were people's homes and had been for centuries uh, millennia uh, and those people had changed the landscape, they had changed the habitat. They were natural predators, so they were keeping uh, some of the game animals in, in a different kind of balance to what happens if you remove the predators, which is what the national parks did. They removed the people, uh, kick out the people. They also removed the wolves and various other predators. The herds grow far too big. That kind of thing is happening today. You take somewhere like Botswana and the Chobe National Park, the carrying capacity of Chobe um, is only, well, there's seven times more elephants in the Chobe National Park than the land can actually carry. So uh, what you get is uh, you favour this so-called megafauna because that's what the tourists want to see uh, and that's what the tourists are prepared to pay to see. Uh, the elephants, of course, take out a lot of the biodiversity. They take out a lot of the tree cover. Uh, they including rare trees, so you get a, a massive drop in biodiversity. That's what happens in national parks. Generally, you get a drop in biodiversity rather than uh, the reverse. The other way people... There are lots of ways people uh, change the landscape. A lot of them have only been recognised, actually, over the last 20, 30 years. And a, a lot of that recognition is still confined to academic sources... Uh, fire is a, is a key part. By setting fire to the undergrowth, you clear areas, you encourage new shoots, uh, you bring in different kind of game, you, diff you bring in a different kind of um, uh, uh, both fauna and flora. Uh, peoples are carrying seeds. Uh, the the so-called hunter-gathering uh, baka pygmies in Cameroon will carry... Uh, yam seeds in, into different parts of the forest so they're not actually cultivating the way we think of cultivating but they are changing the landscape there's an idea now that Amazonia uh, the, the entire area of Amazonia it is quite possible has all been cleared all of it at some stage in the last 10,000 years because that is the length of the human habitation and the first explorers that went down the Napo and then the Amazon uh, 450 years ago um, uh, talked of uh, huge towns uh, uh, which they call cities on the banks uh, which then disappeared. Those accounts were thought to be exaggerated until fairly recently it's now thought that they probably aren't, they probably weren't exaggerated. People were changing the landscape. People have been changing the landscape everywhere. This idea that you know, in, in Mesopotamia 13, 12, 13,000 years ago Agriculture was discovered and that changed everything and has created, you know, um, these terrible problems. Uh, if you actually look at what really happened, people were domesticating animals a, a long time before that. Anybody who's lived with forest-dwelling hunter-gatherers uh, uh, will know how they have pets. Uh, they domesticate all kinds of animals. The dog was domesticated many tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. People probably took uh, the bottle gourd vine uh, from Africa on the peregrinations out of Africa starting 60,000 years ago and they cultivated it everywhere in tropical forests where it could be cultivated. So a lot of these things, only people are only just starting to realise it. Why do people in the Andes 
do this strip farming and have lots of little fields in lots of different places. Surely it's more sensible to have all the fields in one kind of place. While in the Middle Ages in Europe, people also did this strip farming. Uh, the advantage of strip farming is uh, you're covering different altitudes, you're covering different aspects of the hill. So if one part fails, another part is less likely to fail. So these, these are not, these pe people are not stupid. Uh, tribal peoples are not stupid. Uh, people in the Middle Ages were not stupid. The way peoples are able to live uh, off and with their land is, uh, has been carefully thought through. And then we turn up and we say, oh, but, you know, let's all grow soya or whatever it is uh, and make a lot of money for uh, not very many people. The other part of the con is that uh, these uh, organisations have basically favoured tourism over the environment. Uh, you can see that clearly in national parks all over the world. You're not seeing uh, a, a, a wilderness. Uh, in Africa, there are lodges, there are roads, there are uh, concreted um, water holes, there are salt licks deliberately put in places so which attract the game so the tourists can, can see the game. So these environments are manipulated. Now they're manipulated by a, a tourist agenda, a so-called conservationist agenda. Another part of the con is, is who controls these organisations. You look at their boards, uh, who is on their boards? Uh, Coca-Cola, mining companies, uh, logging companies, uh, mega industrialists, uh, those are the people who are actually in control uh, of these organisations. So it's not really surprising actually that their agenda uh, is not really what um, the public thinks their agenda is. This is we're talking about um, a, a, a con trick on a, on a very big uh, scale. More particularly from our point of view, uh, the, one of the main problems about this is they kick the people out, uh, they call this relocation, they can pretend it's voluntary. Now in India, in tiger reserves, they're pretending this is, these are voluntary locations, they're not, uh, there's coercion, there's pressure, uh, there's often a physical violence involved. So these are, these are violent evictions. Um, uh, the, the, the park guards, the eco-guards, uh, are paid for and supplied by these uh, conservation organisations, uh, will then maintain campaigns of abuse, uh, beating people up, uh, torturing them even, and so on and so forth, to stop them going back into, into the forest. Uh, meanwhile, the poachers, uh, right, the real poachers, often the eco-guards themselves, uh, in complicity with the local authorities, uh, or big people in WWF, uh, trustees of w uh, trustees WWF South Africa, hunting an endangered uh, forest elephant in Cameroon a couple of years ago um, uh, for trophy. Uh, environmental organisations partner with uh, trophy hunting organisations and trophy hunting which is actually at the origin if you look at the history of environmentalism um, in the States and also in Europe you find trophy hunting is a key feature of this uh, so the, the local peoples aren't allowed to hunt rich people who come in and pay as uh, you saw recently there was a, a rhino auction for hunt a rhino, if you remember, in Namibia about two or three years ago, um, won by somebody in the Dallas Sport Hunting Club or something like that, a hunting club which is now part of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So sport hunting, trophy hunting is perceived openly, if you look for it, a lot of this is hidden, but if you look for it, you will see that, that a lot of the environmental organisations are saying this is an integral part of conservation. Mm. What they really mean is it's money. Mm. Uh, there are partnerships with logging organisations. Um, in, the, in the Congo Basin, WF partners with logging organisations. They advise the government on how to carve up uh, the areas uh, and partly part of it goes to sport hunting concessions, part of it goes to logging concessions uh, and part of it goes to uh, parks, national parks. In any event, the uh, local pygmy peoples, the people who have owned this land since uh, anybody can ever remember, uh, 
are out. We first really took an interest in this in Botswana because we were trying to prevent the eviction of Bushmen from an area called the Central Kalahari Game Reserve in the middle of Botswana, a huge area about the size of Switzerland. And uh, the government had talked of evicting these people since 82, when diamonds were first discovered. And they finally evicted almost all of them, bar about two dozen in 2002. And then we uh, helped the Bushmen take the government to court, actually, to get that reversed. Court case lasted for many years, longest court case ever in Botswana's uh, legal history. The Bushmen <coughs> eventually won it. Um, and uh, there are now Bushmen living in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve as a result. Incidentally, I use the term Bushmen deliberately for the anthropologists say I don't use the term sand for various reasons which we can discuss but which are peripheral to the, my uh, main points. Uh, so uh, during that court case, the key uh, expert witness called by the government was an American environmentalist who uh, uh, said falsely, it was a fabrication, that the Bushmen's tiny herds of goats, this is the area size of Switzerland, about 700 Bushmen there. Nobody else lives there. They have uh, herds of goats, maybe a dozen, 15, 18 goats. They said that these uh, herds of goats were transmitting disease to the wild uh, fauna. It, it simply was not true. Uh, so the other part of the con is how the environmental movement has used manipulated information, invented information. There's a big current issue, you may have come across it, where which tries to link uh, ivory poaching with Al-Shabaab terrorists, these are the Somali terrorists, the people responsible for the Westgate massacre, the shopping mall massacre in Nairobi, a few years ago, and there's a film made by an American, a short um, cartoon film actually, where you see people being killed in Westgate by the terrorists, and that is supposedly directly linked to ivory poaching. The idea is, pay your dollar to stop ivory poaching, you will defund the terrorists. It's not true. There is no evidence. Uh, the, 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 the allegation starts with a single article written by a guy who is... Um, his job is to militarize environmentalism and uh, the figures he uses for the amount of money going to Al-Shabaab are believed by nobody who knows, including the UN, including Interpol, by nobody who knows the situation well. So we're talking about the manufacture of uh, uh, an imagery which is simply false. And this hurts local people a lot. Uh, people end up being shot on sight. Now it's fairly routine in Botswana, for instance, they shoot people coming over from Namibia and then plant uh, ivory uh, on them. So th th this is not a, a, a small issue, this is a, a major issue which is in fact growing uh, all the time. As I said, the other part of it is it doesn't work anyway. The national park model actually results in a decrease in biodiversity. And the studies have been done for 20, 30 years uh, showing this. Uh, the areas, say, in Amazonia, where you have the most biodiversity and the least uh, logging, are the indigenous-run areas. They are not protected in any other way. So actually, Given the billions going into environmentalism, there is a very cheap way. I mean, everybody wants to, doesn't want to see these areas industrialized and chopped down and all the rest of it, obviously. There's a much cheaper way of doing it, which is to empower and enable the people to own this land under international law anyway to continue to live there and to manage it. And it would cost extremely little, which is probably the reason it's not going to happen, which is because as soon as you say that, it means in fact the millions and billions going into the environmental organizations are not achieving their state of aid. So they're hurting people, they're, they're hurting the environment, they're not achieving the aim. Anyway, so all, all of that we've sort of wrapped up into one idea of the con, and our principal message there is to say that tribal peoples 
are the best conservationists. That doesn't mean they're all brilliant conservationists, but they're the best. They're better than the competition. You know, the competition, frankly, is not very good. So uh, as, as a broad generalization, they are the best conservationists we have. And what should be happening if people care about the environment uh, and these institutions care about the environment is they should be going to these people and saying, look, uh, this is your land. If you want us to help you protect it from industrialization, uh, logging, extractive industries, and so on and so forth, tell us how to do it because we, the environmental organizations, have the resources uh, which you don't. But in real life, the people are thrown out. We don't know of a single case where an environmental organization has objected to people being thrown out. In the central Kalahari Game Reserve, when the Bushmen were thrown out, lots of environmental organizations working in Botswana. The Botswana president's on the board of Conservation International. He travels around being the big shot conservationist and faked and all this to it. And not a single uh, conservation organization raised a murmur about the eviction of the Bushmen, nor, incidentally, did they raise a murmur when the government built uh, uh, a diamond mine right in the middle of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, uh, adjacent to a Bushman community. So all of that's the common, if you like, and uh, we want to push this message. Uh, we know it's controversial. Uh, we know we will probably lose support as a result of it, because, of course, the people who support our type of organization tend often to see themselves as uh, allied with the environmental movement. They see themselves as environmentalists. So uh, we will probably lose support as a result. But unless this message is, is pushed hard, nothing is going to change. And what we hope will happen is that if we, it's not going to happen overnight, is if we persist in presenting this message, which I've outlined briefly in a minutes, um, that uh, uh, eventually and hopefully fairly quickly, people within these organizations, people who support these organizations, will raise these issues and will create a movement uh, to get things changed. So that's the environmentalist part of Survival International's campaign. And that's about uh, all I wanted to say. So uh, before we, I don't know if we're going to break or not, or before we have questions, but we did have one last film, and I come back to Tesha's story. Remember Tesha being in the Pygmies um, eight years ago, and uh, when we started this Stop the Con campaign, uh, Tesha basically launched it uh, in, in the way you're going to see now. Today is the scariest adventure of my life. El Capitan, 3,000 feet in the sky with only a rope? I will. You'll see. I love this place. I've come every summer since I was a little girl. And every year she whispers of wonders yet to see. She beckons me to explore her secret waterfalls, meadows, and peaks. But it's more than a place. It's a space for reflection, for breathing and stillness, for adventure and challenge, for self-discovery and pushing my limits. But my love for this place won't change the fact that hundreds of Native Americans were thrown out when it was turned into a park. And it doesn't change the fact that since their eviction, the health of these woods and valleys has deteriorated. Most importantly, it doesn't change the fact that this model, this method of making parks, is still happening all over the world today, like with tiger reserves in India and parks in Cameroon. National parks must not destroy human lives. This so-called wilderness is a myth. All our sacred, untouched places have actually been cared for by guardians for thousands of years. If we continue to destroy tribal people, we'll continue to destroy nature, and we'll continue to destroy our future. It really is time for a new conservation, one that works with tribes and not against them. 
It really is time to stop this conservation con. Today is the scariest adventure of my life. El Capitan, 3,000 feet in the sky with only a rope? I'm frightened, terrified even. But I am doing this for tribal people, to protect their right to be free in their sacred places. I'm doing this for their survival, and for our own. Stop the con.